welcome. We're very, very glad that you've taken the time to come today to learn more about Micropulse Diode Laser. Um, we have three very experienced and distinguished panelists, and as they present their cases, I hope that you'll feel free to raise your hand and interrupt them just to be certain that any questions you have about the treatment are answered. Um, I just wanted to show three quick slides um, because I thought that not everyone is familiar with the concept of micropulse lasers, so please forgive me if you've already seen these slides. But normally, when we do laser treatment, we have a continuous treatment duration, and as we treat the retinal pigment epithelium, its temperature increases, and then when the pulse goes off, the temperature slowly decreases. And as you know, the heat uh, spreads from the retinal pigment epithelium into the retina and damages the retina. And the, probably biologically, the way the laser treatment works is not by these cells that we're treating directly, which are killed by the laser uh, when we're doing continuous wavelength, but by the cells at the edge of the spot that have just been damaged and are not going to die but produce proteins that are induced by the stress that actually promote photoreceptor survival and change the permeability properties of the retina. Well, in micropulse laser, what we do is take this continuous application and break it up into short intervals. And as you see, as you break the, the uh, treatment into short intervals, the temperature rises less. Uh, but if you do the frequency of the pulses enough, eventually you can create a temperature rise in the target tissue. By making what's called the duty cycle low enough, you can actually deliver energy without changing the temperature of the adjacent tissue and without raising the temperature of the retinal pigment epithelium to a level that the cells are going to die. And as a result of that, the RP cells not only don't die, but they become factories that produce substances that help reverse the changes induced by the diabetic retinopathy. I, the reason I'm showing you these slides is for this. So you will see what terminology means. So the pulse on time is the micropulse duration. The pulse off time is the micropulse yes. interval. Yes. And the total period is called the envelope. So if we look at this, this is a 200 millisecond envelope. And inside of that envelope, we have very brief periods where the laser energy is being applied. That's the pulse duration and much longer periods where there's no energy being applied. And of course, that's the pulse interval. The ratio of the duration to the total period is called the duty cycle. So if we have pulse on for two milliseconds and off for 1.8 milliseconds, the duty cycle is 0 0.2 divided by two, which is a 10% duty cycle. Does that make sense? Very important to understand what a duty cycle is. I want to show you my last slide. Yes, who was at the retina subspecialty day yesterday? Was anyone there? Okay. There was a very important piece of information that wasn't communicated about confluent micropulse laser treatment. And it's shown right here in this particular study done by Dr. Cardillo. But there are other studies that show the same thing. And what I want to focus on is high density micropulse laser. And you can see, I want to show you the amount of visual improvement that's been observed. Three lines, three ETDRS lines or more in 50% of the patients. That's, I'm not trying to compare results in two different studies, but that's about the same level of visual improvement that you see with anti-VEGF therapy. But you have to use high density treatment. If you use normal density treatment, you don't get that result. That's a very important point. Why is that? Because if you look at the structure of the randomized clinical trials, patients with visual acuity better than 2040 were not enrolled in the anti-VEGF injection trials. So for example, I take care of, a, of an internist who's had focal laser treatment in the past, who has a parafoveal cyst and 2025 vision. Of course, I can inject anti-VEGF therapy into that person, but another thing I could do would be micropulse diode laser treatment. And it actually is probably safer to do the laser treatment than to do the injection. So I just want to make that suggestion to you as you think about the information you're about to see. So now it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Stella Pujovic. She is an assistant professor at the University of Padua, where she was a resident. She completed fellowship training at Moorfields, and she's involved in a number of studies in Europe, and she's an expert and is going to teach us 
uh, how to do this by giving some case examples. Hello to everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. So I will share with you three cases of uh, diabetic patients Hi. treated with subthreshold microbus laser. So this is the first case, a male, uh, 54 years old, with type 2 diabetes mellitus since 4 years on tablets. He's a HBA1 uh, 6.8. He had a good visual acuity, you see 2020, and he presented in his left eye with this uh, you, focal, thanks. let's say, uh, let me just see, okay, focal, not center involving diabetic macular edema with his heart exudates. You can see on this is microperimetry reduced retinal sensitivity in the areas of increased retinal thickness. So this patient was treated with subthreshold micropulse diode laser treatment using the 5% duty cycle, 750 millivolts was the power, uh, and uh, the spot size was 125 micro. The treatment was performed in a continuous fashion, so it was a high density treatment over the areas of increased retinal thickness. Stella, yeah. tell us exactly how you do high density treatment, please. Okay. High density treatment is performed, so you put the one spot uh, in a confluent manner, uh, all the spots, Drink, no so more. you perform treat completely like you paint all this area of increased retinal thickness. What, what spot size did you use? Spot size was 125 micron. What was your duration, your pulse duration? The pulse duration is so 5% within 0 0.2 uh, seconds. So 5% duty cycle, yeah. 0 0.2 seconds. Yeah. And how do you decide what power to use? We use the standard power, usually, and it is always 750 microns. In these cases, where the edema, where the uh, retinal thickness is not superior to 400 microns. So, in where I practice, I have white patients and black patients and brown patients. Yeah. Would, what would you advise me? Should I start with the same power in everyone, or how should I approach With this that? power and this duty cycle so, cycle, so it is the lowest duty cycle, just 5%, you are quite sure that you cannot uh, burn the retina. Okay? So, if we see this uh, here on these color images, you can see very well how heart exudates after six months decreased in the areas of treatment, both here and also here. And also on OCT you can see decreased retinal thickness in the areas of treatment. Better see on this scan, line scans. Here you can see these are the infrared images. These are uh, short wavelength fundus autofluorescence and this is the infrared uh, fundus autofluorescence. And you can see that there are no signs of treatment even after the retreatment, because the retreatment was performed at three months. So you don't see any signs of the treatment and the level of the retinal pigment epithelium. Here on fluorescent angiography, this is the baseline fluorescent angiography, and this is after six months, you see also decrease in the leakage after the treatment. When you treated, did you treat through the fovea also? No, I, uh, I usually don't treat the fovea. I treat to the edge of the fovea vascular zone. Does any, do any of the panelists treat through the fovea? Yes. Yeah. Martin, why don't you tell us what your experience is with that? Well, I'm using the yellow laser and I can go through the fovea in every case, if needed. Yes. Yeah, theoretically it is safe, yeah, but I arrived to the edge. Okay, so this is the second case. Uh, this is the patient with type 1 diabetes mellitus since 18 years. He had HbA1c of 7.8. You see here that there is a decrease in visual acuity. It is in his left eye, this is the error. And the patient presented with this center involving exudative diabetic macular edema. You see the large cyst, central cyst on OCT. And on microperimetry, you see this significant decrease in retinal sensitivity. In this case, the patient was injected with the intravitreal lucentis, and the patient performed three injections each month. 
and you see that after three injections the patient got worse so he had an increase in retinal thickness so we continued the treatment and thereafter six injections he started to get, uh, to get better so uh, retinal thickness decreased and as you can see also visual acuity increased so and it reached 55 letters so then he was stabilized he reached the stabilization in visual acuity and also in retinal thickness so the patient was not injected anymore but he was treated now with a, a subthreshold micropass diode laser in the same manner as before so the high density treatment with confluent spots and also the same parameters so 750 milliwatt and also 125 microns per diameter and 5% duty cycle. Stella, where did you put the treatment in this patient? Yes, yeah. in this patient I treated all the area of increased, so it is here, all the area of increased retinal thickness apart the fovea. And how do you know where you've treated? Do you just go across? Yeah, across, like if you paint, let's say, paint the retina. So how long does it take to do one of these treatments compared to a typical thermal focal laser treatment? Uh, yes, it is a little bit longer, a little bit, not too much. It's a little bit longer, definitely. But you are not, let's say, stressed that you can burn the fovea and you are not stressed if the patient moves a little bit the eye because you are quite safe. So you, are, you just perform, you put the repetition mode, you can put it on the machine, the repetition mode, which you feel comfortable. For example, I put 400 milliseconds, so it is like uh, one treatment and one other spot. So you have the time also to see, to control for the, also the movement of the eye of the patient. So after, yeah? The edema here is right in the center of the area. So where exactly did you treat Yeah. Like so, uh, let me just show you the image. Can I show you the image? So, I treat it. So, if you put here, I treat. I start like this, and I treat all this area. All like this, like this. Then I go here, here, okay? All of this area, apart the fovea. So, I treat... Many spots roughly with uh, Yeah, if you have, it depends obviously on the case. extension of edema. In this case, so this was the baseline here, it uh, was not treated the patient. It was afterwards when the edema was, uh, was not so extended. It, it is something like 400, 450 spots, it depends on the area. So it is, let's say the treatment is, uh, from this point of view, more intensive. It is, you put more spots than, with, than you are used to do it with the modified ETDRS treatment. Let me ask the panel, do you ever worry about retreating over where you've already treated when you're using sub-threshold micropulse diode laser? No. no. Very important point, because you can't see where you've treated, but it's okay to go over where you've already treated. And do you go right through the macular bundle, like in this case? Yeah. It shouldn't make any difference. Yes. Do you use the pattern to use the treat the patient? A pattern uh -huh. to, to treat the patient? No, I just put the code. We don't have, it is not like Pascal. You, you, you intend it in that way. There is no possibility to do it like this. You put, let's say, manually single spots. Single spots, yeah. but in a confluent yeah, manner. Single. Yeah, but in a confluent manner. Okay. There is a, up until now, the pattern is not available as far as I'm okay, informed. Okay. Focus. I think that the focus is extremely important because you don't, yeah. you really have to concentrate that the that the aiming beam is really focused all the time because again you're not you have no feedback. So how yeah. do you how do you approach that? Stella, why don't yeah. you tell us? Uh, yeah, the focus is very important. I agree with you. But uh, when you put, the, as I told you, the repetition mode, you have uh, not very quick, so you have the time to move your focus and uh, usually it is not a big problem in a person who performs right. normally laser. Because I mean, I mean the main complication of this procedure is under treatment. Under. So if you're not in focus, you're under treating the, the patient if you're not in perfect focus. Sure, you're right. Yeah. So do you, do you agree with that, Tim and Martin? I agree with that. I think that really it's critical to have excellent focus here because we have none of our traditional feedback. So. You know, I will use the spot size for burn intensity because of barrier pigmentation in my patients in Miami. 
and then I use that to modulate my intensity. I'm very good about having my patients be very, very positioned on the slip mat. So I like them to hold and come forward, and I'll often have somebody hold their head. Yeah, I do too. My biggest thing with position usually is the patient moving. That, that's what I mean, you know, they move away. So if I can have them stabilized in the slip mat, I really haven't had issues with, with the problem with focus. And the other thing is, is that, you know, I use the continuous paint mode as I come back. So I'm patterning myself. I'm not, the laser is not patterning for me, but I'm patterning. And then, you know, because the issue here is under treatment, which is a, you know, to me, my worry always in the past had been over treatment. So under treatment to me is a significantly less concerning complication because now I have the capacity to go back and retreat. But I'd rather have a single treatment, so I'm really focused, as you mentioned, on having good position, good focus, and, and be very attentive to, to the quality of the aiming beam during the treatment itself. When you say you have a paint mode, when you, you're, uh, does that mean you're turning the... So I'm using repetition. The repetition. So very short repetition. So very short, like uh, the... the, the so, right, right, right. So, you know, for me, I, I would literally go in and I am going to just paint and continuously move my aiming beam through the focus of the sector that I'm doing. But obviously using individual spots, because the laser also has a continue. A, no, a paint mode, paint. which is where it's just right. infinite duration. So yeah, you don't want to do that. No, this is five percent duty right. cycle. Okay. So what I mean in a continuous mode here is a repetition mode with fast repetition delivery. So that from from your perspective, you're moving the aiming right. beam, and the laser is having interrupted micro pulse delivery at the preset parameters through that. So it's like a hundred, a hundred millisecond yeah, like repeat 100. mode, whatever. I think we've gone down to 50. Yeah. So that's, they're talking about a very important technical detail. Does everyone understand what they've concluded? Okay. Martin, do you agree with that? Well, uh, yes, that's sure that you must be sure that your focus is already set in your lamp. In my case, I'm the only one that I use the, that lamp, so there's no trouble uh, for change in the focus. By the way, we have multilingual speakers here, so if someone speaks Spanish or Italian and they don't understand what we're saying in English, you should raise your hand and we'll, we'll translate that for you, okay? <laughs> we even speak a little French. <laughs> okay, and this is just to show you, this is uh, the last follow-up was at 12 months. It was f now four months after the laser treatment. So we usually evaluate the patients three or four months after the treatment, laser treatment, not immediately, not after one month. And as you can see here, there is a significant decrease in heart exudates after the treatment, increase in retinal sensitivity on microperimetry, and decrease in retinal thickness. So this is the last case that I want to show you. A patient with a, uh, diabetes mellitus type 2 since 10 years. You see that HB uh, A1C is 8. Uh, good visual acuity. And you can see these dense heart exudates approaching the fovea, approaching the fovea, both superiorly and inferiorly. You see increased retinal thickness, okay, not involving the center. And also you see the signs of leakage on fluorescein angiography. This patient was treated with subthreshold yellow microparts laser, and here the parameters that I used were uh, 100 micron spot size, okay, so it was always 5% duty cycle, and uh, 250 milliwatt was the power. It was performed in the same way over the areas of increased retinal thickness. So if you look here, so it was performed all in this area and all in this area. After three months, you see that uh, it did not change so much. Even here you can see some increase in retinal uh, thickness. There is some slight decrease in heart exudates in this area and the patient was retreated in the same way. Now it was treated this area this and this and after six months if you look here you see that there is now a significant increase in retinal sensitivity and decrease in retinal thickness that you can better see it here on OCT line scans you see over the areas of 
decreased retinal thickness. And also in this kind of treatment, there were no signs on fundus autofluorescence of the treatment. So you don't see any scars at the level of the retinal pigment epithelium. Okay. Thank you, Stella. So now it's uh, a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Tim Murray. Dr. Murray is a graduate of the Johns Hopkins University and the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He completed residency training at the University of California in San Francisco, and he was a tenured full professor of ophthalmology at Beskin Palmer Institute for probably 20 years. He's one of the most renowned ocular oncologists in the world, and we're very uh, pleased to have him share his experience with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Great and introduction. Let me, let me, uh, so it's kind of fun to be here, you know, the focus for um, micropulse technology really has been uh, in, in vascular driven diseases such as vascular occlusion or diabetes. I'm going to move you into a realm that I deal with daily and that, that I think really is uniquely accessible to micropulse technology because there isn't really an existing available standard of care treatment for us. So I'm going to talk to you about radiation retinopathy. That was dealt with at the pre-academy yesterday with a panel by Evan Gregudis. Radiation retinopathy, when we look at uh, patients with spectral domain OCT, is probably present in almost 100% of patients. And it is the major cause of visual loss in patients that have undergone radiation treatment for an ocular malignancy. And what you see here is that the clinical history was much lower, but as we view spectral domain OCT, by nine months, about 85% of patients have OCT evidence of radiation maculopathy. So it, we've begun to use anti-VEGF and we've also investigated intravitreal steroid therapy, but really we've had a very strong interest in the application of micropulse laser technology. And the benefit to micropulse technology here is the ability to deliver laser, alter the microenvironment for these patients without having thermal destruction of retinal tissue. So it is an ideal place for us to consider this kind of treatment. Now, we use a standard COMS configured plaque. We treat to 85 grade of the apex. We're very critically focused to make sure the radi radiation is delivered to the tumor in a centered pattern. The study methods for us were tumor control of the patients before we consider treatment, decline in vision, and radiation maculopathy. So I didn't have a lot of experience with micropulse technology. I've had a lot of experience with iridex and laser technology. And the take home message for me is to tell you that this is probably one of the easiest things that I have ever done. And because the therapeutic window here is so large, the anxiety of a new treatment really wasn't present here when I treated the first patient. So a 50 year old woman treated with brachytherapy in March of 2009 she developed radiation retinopathy in July of 2012. She presented to us with vision of 2100 with excellent tumor control. And she had what we call a grade five retinopathy. You can see the temporal tumor. The tumor really has responded beautifully. And this is her OCT. She's got severe cystic maculopathy with the vision decrease associated with that. Historically, we've treated these patients with anti-VEGF therapy or, or with steroid. My interest is that they seem to require repetitive anti-VEGF, and I was interested in would micropulse enable me to either spare the patient the need of further anti-VEGF or allow me to move the window of anti-VEGF therapy to a greater time frame, so from six weeks to maybe six months of treatment. These are the parameters that we used. I used an Iridex IQ 532. I used a test burn because there's a lot of variation in pigment. I, did the, I doubled the test burn intensity to um, the power for treatment. I used 100 micron spot size, 200 millisecond pulse duration, and a 5% duty cycle, and I used a repetitive pulse mode for retreatment. Tim, I have a question. Yes. When you say you did a test burn at 80 milliwatts, what's your clinical endpoint for that test burn? So I wanted to see a widening of the retina, and I treated in an area away from the macula with standard pigmentation. Did you look for mild whitening or intense whitening? You know, I want, I want moderate whitening, so I'm not looking for mild and I'm not looking for intense. I'm looking about half of what we used to do with ETDRS intense burning. So kind of how I would like to see a, a, a whitening change if I was using a standard focal therapy. Um, and I do that away from any visually significant structure. And I'm interested in the pigmentation and the thickness being relatively comparable to where I'm going to treat. 
And then what you'll see when you treat these patients is I look for where the tumor margin is and I put in a sector that goes from the tumor margin in, a, in sort of a compacting style directly toward the FAZ. I'm not concerned about treating through the FAZ, but in these patients, since they were early for me, I, I did not treat beyond the FAZ margin itself. I used 244 pulses. The patient said it, that they were very concerned about the treatment and, and felt nothing, and it literally took me less than about seven minutes to treat. So this is the patient. Now, with these early treatments, I'm combining Avastin with micropulse therapy, and I can tell you that that response we've never seen before. So this patient's visual acuity improved to 2025 on follow-up at a three-month window after treatment, had resolution of the cystic edema, and did not require retreatment. So before and after, we did not see our treatment burns with spectral domain OCT. The, the concern that I had initially with this was, what am I doing with this treatment? How do I know how I've treated and where I've treated? And I can tell you that really the practicality of this is, I'm really now less concerned about that than I am concerned about what the anatomic and visual response is for these patients. So these are response characteristics that we have not seen with standard anti-VEGF therapy in patients with radiation retinopathy. So about 60% incidence of radiation retinopathy in 2012. Average incidence from uh, time to development is about 10.8 months. This is how we treated patients before micropulse. This patient's vision is 2400 with cyst, has gotten now repetitive anti-VEGF, five intravitreal bevacizumide treatments. The vision's better. I'm thrilled, but you can see that you have persistent intraretinal cystic edema. This is not a, an eye free of active maculopathy. So really my conclusions are with this is that this is an incredibly exciting avenue of new treatment where there is no existing real standard of care and these patients have no opportunity to therapy. This may be the, the gimme for micropulse therapy and at least initially to couple that with anti-VEGF and look at expanding that window. So I, I will tell you that this first case was, was a game changer for me. It was like my first macular hole surgery. You know, the first time you operated a macular hole and it closed and you looked and the patient went from 2200 to 2025 and you were like, I don't care what anybody says, this works. And that's kind of how I felt with this treatment. Any questions for me? Yes, sir. Okay, so where do I treat? So great question. So here's the primary tumor. You can see the extension of the closing. Here's the closure center. So what I did is I took a put a border from here like this. And I, and I swept continuously back and forth, continuous being repetitive, okay, collapsing towards the FAZ. The FAZ. Literally took me, I, I would say, less than seven minutes. The patient didn't feel a thing. Now, she was a great patient, perfect positioning, ideal candidate for treatment. But I'll tell you that, that because I, I, I was comfortable enough with this now, that my inclusion criteria for treating my patients now is I'm treating anyone who is presenting with vision between 2040 and 2200 that has had a declining vision with, with primary maculopathy on speckle domain OCT. And initially I'm coupling that with an anti-VEGF, but the responses are so interesting that now I'm thinking about trying to treat them with micropulse first, holding anti-VEGF therapy and coming back to anti-VEGF if I'm unhappy with the response of two months. You always guide through the OCT instead of the AG uh, fluorescein? So, so I think the OCT is more important than fluorescein and looking for the maculopathy component. What fluorescein is important is looking for ischemic correction. So I, I've never I'm lost to have a fluorescein, but I don't think fluorescein guides therapy. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Flores from Mexico, who has an extensive experience treating patients with severe macular edema using micropulse diode laser? Uh, well, we have a lot of, of options, uh, pharmacological options to treat the diabetic macular edema. But we must remember that laser is still the gold standard to treat macular edema on diabetes. We have uh, using a lot of time the focal laser, the grid laser, or the ETDRS standard protocol. Uh, or the modified protocol. But our new goal is not to harm the retina. So we have a new technique using the micropulse laser with confluent low energy treatments. And I will show 
some cases for you. This is our case number one. It's a male of 61 years old with uh, diabetes uh, type 2 since 16 years ago. He, comp he complains of decrease in his visual acuity since uh, in the ocular in the left eye since two years ago. This is his visual acuity and he hasn't received a previous treatment. Well, this is the baseline images of the case. We have the visual acuity of 2200. We apply the micropoles in all the area of edema, all this area in a very high confluent manner and three months after the first treatment we have less hard exudates we have in the OCT we have seen if we compare both images less exudates and at nine months of follow-up there are a very low amount of exudates and the vision uh, at the Vision is 2040. Martin, can this I ask you case, a question? Yes. When you treat a patient with micropulse, how long, how soon do you expect to begin to see a clinical response? How long after you do the treatment? Well, it depends on the thickness of the retina, because if we have a very huge amount of liquid, the response is it will take too much time to be observed. In this case, the response is very fast. I think between three to six weeks after the first treatment, we can see the changes. If, if, you re if you treated a person and you didn't see a response, how long would you wait before repeating the treatment? Well, by protocol, we wait till the third month to perform another treatment. Our second case is a female, 66 years old, uh, with diabetes since nine years ago. She complains decrease in visual acuity on her left eye from four years ago. She had received multiple previous macular treatment. So we can see our baseline uh, image with the visual acuity, we performed the treatment in all this area, obviously avoiding the vessels and in a highly confluent manner. This is the angiography at baseline and this is at three months. You can see this that I call the dispersion phase. Sometime after using the micropulse laser, we can see the hard exudates dispersing around the area where they were placed before. And at six months, we can see the changes, less leakage. And in this autofluorescence image, we can see, we can see the lesions of the laser. We can only see the previous treatment laser scars, as you can compare with the baseline angiography. So this is very important because we are not uh, causing more damage to the retina. We can preserve tissue. What parameters are you using? Well, uh, I, I will talk about the parameters at the end. We are using uh, standard parameters in all the cases now. This is our third case is a male, uh, 52 years old. He has decreased in his visual acuity in both eyes since one year ago. And obviously, as you can see, she, he has a PRP treatment before. So this is our right eye. We treat all this area with the micropulse laser. Something that this is important, we pass through the phobia when needed without any fear to harm the phobia. And this is the result at six months of follow-up in the right eye. As you can see, there is no changes in the autofluorescence image six months after the treatment. And in the left eye, we treat 
all this area, all this area with the micropulse laser, and at six months you can see practically no changes in the autofluorescence image. So the parameters. We are using between 50 to 100 milliwatts. It depends on the age of the patients, the amount of the edema, the thickness of the retina. We are using between 40 to 80 milliseconds and a dirty cycle of 10%. We treat all the area of edema in a very high confluent manner of the spots. This is the treated area. We are using the mainster lens and of course we have not uh, lesions, visible lesions in the retina. Yes. Oh, uh, 100 microns of the spot. 100 microns. Well, so we can conclude that thermal damage is not required to obtain a therapeutic effect on the retina, as you can see in the image. It is supposed that the laser stimulates the RPE in order to downregulate or upregulate cytokines in order to have the effect in the retina, a local effect in the retina. What we have learned is to treat not only the area, area of edema, but the, surround, the area surround the edema, about five or six rows of laser on healthy pigmented epithelium. Why is this? Because we are trying to stimulate normal cells to produce some cytokines in order to have a better result in the improvement of the edema. We have no inflammation after the laser and of course we have no loss of tissue after treatment. Do you have any questions? Martin, thank you. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all. I want to thank our speakers for presenting such great cases. And thank you all for your kind attention. I hope you found this useful. Uh, some of us will be here afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you very much.